It's a beautiful Friday on the river. I'm out here today in late afternoon as the sun is going down a little bit to hopefully try and catch some trout. This particular river has brown, brook, and rainbow trout, and at this point I'm willing to catch anything I can. I always release the fish I catch unless I'm camping because I'm not such a huge fan of the taste of them. On the same day I filmed the first video on the channel with Ryan, we caught one brown trout of pretty decent size. I was hoping to get another one in the lower pool, but as you can see, I didn't have much luck. We also have the long nose sucker in this river, but they aren't very reactive to lures or bait, and mostly just nibble on algae and scum at the bottom of the river. They also react very little to people swimming near them or standing by them, so I hope that sometime this summer I can use that to my advantage and spear them. As a matter of fact, the majority of fish at the moment are unresponsive due to a number of reasons. To begin with, the weather has been too clear. The sun shining down with such intensity makes any lures we use flash unnaturally, which can actually have the opposite effect and scare some fish away. Along with that, the river has been very slow and shallow lately, giving fish plenty of time to be choosy about what to eat as it floats past. As of a week from the day of filming, we are still waiting for a good rain to refresh the river. The sky is particularly beautiful this evening, and I made special point to take some video to show you all the colors. Unfortunately, our river is under attack at the moment and for the foreseeable future. In the area of New York State where we live, both Japanese knotweed and barberry have become terrible invasive species, choking out the areas by the rivers especially, an exceptionally fragile ecosystem. Along with their root systems which strangle the local plant life and tangling limbs which turn the above ground into a jungle, they also present a significant challenge to get rid of. We can't use plant killers as they're too close to the river and would pollute the water. Knotweed especially has become a clever enemy to combat. Even knocking it down spreads broken segments of the plant down river where they can take root and flourish even further. Just around 12 years ago, recently enough for me to have seen it in my lifetime, this area was completely knotweed free. Unfortunately, there isn't much we can do to stop it and has just become a part of life for us now. The family and I went up to one of our local lakes this week. It's a summer tradition for us to meet at the lake house where my aunt and uncle live and see their dogs and the rest of the family. It's a great place to swim, fish, kayak, and explore, and is an area rich in local history and rural mythology.
The lake is home to pumpkin seeds, or sunnies, a type of nesting fish that make little craters for their homes in shallow waters. Perch, which have become pretty rare catch in recent years. Trout and pickerel, which hide in the lily pads, preying on other fish. There are also a few snapping turtles. However, there is no water-dwelling creature nearly as terrifying as Cooper, a big golden retriever good boy who is nearly as goofy as he is lovable. Cooper is my aunt and uncle's dog, and he is well-versed in fishing around the lake. He knows to push around the tethered rowboat to reveal the fish in the shade beneath, at which point he jabs his head into the water or paws at them. He's getting on in years now, so his skills are ever so slightly failing him. His sister is Dixie, and she is much younger and calmer than he is. Last time we saw her, she was a bit wilder, but seems to have mellowed in the last year. One of my favorite spots to visit on the lake is almost directly across from our house, and can be reached by kayaking or swimming across. It's a huge virgin hemlock, aimed so due to its incredible size being an untouched original tree in the forest. Virgin hemlocks are pretty rare in the area, due to logging which fed the tanning industry. With a steady supply of fresh, clean water and acidic hemlock bark which could tan hides quickly, the 1800s and onward proved a boom for the leather industry, at the expense of these massive trees and forests which still are recovering to this day. It made me sad to see when I arrived at the tree that it had fallen over. The top had been knocked out of it for many years due to a lightning strike, but now it's little more than a stump. Fortunately, last year I took some good pictures of it, so it can be remembered even when it's decayed and gone. I just want to say thank you to anyone who watched this video. I am obviously pretty green to this, and a lot of the audio that I record sounds like a robot who has never spoken any human language before. Uh, I'm a bit unused to reading from scripts, and I'm also doing this at 12.22 a.m., so it's uh, it could be better conditions. But thank you very much for watching and for supporting me by doing so, and I look forward to seeing you guys in future do you, do you videos. Do you know why you're back Bye. here? Bye. Oh, no. do, do you know why you're back here? It's because you're in Egypt. Because you, you go running and you go exploring and also because you smell.